So uh, my talk this, um, this morning is about depression and uh, this is uh, complementary to a talk that uh, Nar gave for those of you who, are at, um, who heard her speak on Saturday, Saturday. okay. Um, I am going to give you um, some clinical background to this problem and uh, then I'll describe some of the experiments we've done looking at the genetic basis and the last third of my talk is about the program of work that's being carried out here at UCLA trying to find uh, the origins of depression and to cure the disease. So for the first part of what I want to say, I'm just going to address these, these questions just to give you just an, a brief overview of the, the clinical issues that, uh, uh, that, that we face. So the first problem is how common is depression? And um, it was in last year, ranked the leading cause of disability um, um, by the World Health Organization. They aimed, uh, the original projection was it was going to achieve that on a, in a couple of years time, but um, uh, it's um, now been regarded uh, as beating that, um, uh, that deadline. So it's, it's very common, but just because something is common doesn't mean that it's um, a bad disease, uh, flu and uh, colds are, are common but they're not necessarily bad. I mean the, the trouble of course is with depression is it's it's not just disabling but it can kill and about half of all suicides can be directly directly attributed to the disorder. So it is common, it's disabling and it has a, a, a mortality. What does it cost? This is a bit more difficult to, to work out but it's just a, a ballpark figure to put this in perspective. Um, there are about 245 million prescriptions for antidepressants each year and that comes out as a total cost of something like 10 billion and that's without taking into account the um, cost to, with the economy from people being off work, other people having to care for them and so on. So it's an expensive condition, it's common. Uh, how effective are, are our treatments? I'll just give you one bit of data on, on this. So this is from a um, meta-analysis from a few years ago, looking at the response rates to one of the modalities of treatment, antidepressants, and that looks pretty good. This is response rates after about three months of treatment. But the problem is if you put in the context of what the placebo response is, you can see the increment in effectiveness is, is pretty minimal. Uh, I would expect when I see somebody that I would get some sort of response to about half my patients um, within about three months. That's just as a basic ground rule of clinical practice. So our, we, we do have treatments, but they're, they're not tremendously effective. And given this, you might think that a lot of work is going on to look at um, the causes of depression and try and improve the situation. And I'll show you again just one piece of evidence that that's not the case. This is a summary of NIH funding going into diseases. Um, and uh, you can just about see the small sliver of that um, uh, pie chart that was devoted to depression. Uh, this is in terms of the relative burden of disease, so um, the, the, the ratio is, is really uh, surprisingly low. So it's, it's, I've told you it's common, I've told you it's an expensive disease, we don't have very effective treatments, and we're not spending very much uh, on, on researching this area. Um, one of the reasons for this is because we have made so little progress in understanding the causes of depression over the last hundred years and there is to some extent a feeling that um, this is too hard a problem to, to tackle. But given its importance in, in the clinic, I think this is something that we, we should really uh, readdress. And the rest of what I'm going to be talking to you about is uh, the approaches that, uh, that we've been taking around that issue. Um, I'll, I'll start the second part of my talk just running through some of the basic clinical features to give you an idea of why this has been a, a problem both in the clinic and, and in research. And let me just start with the, the um, simple overview of the symptomatic criteria. So to make a diagnosis of depression, I as a clinician have to find four or more of those symptoms present for at least two weeks in a patient. And you have to have either one uh, diminished interest or pleasure or the second criteria depressed mood along with four other symptoms. Now if you 
look at that list, there's something really striking about it, which is that uh, criteria three or four involve both uh, op opposite changes, so uh, an increase or decrease in weight or appetite, uh, insomnia or hypersomnia. And I don't think there's any other condition when we're allowing the diagnosis to rest on complete opposite symptoms. And this is indicative of something which will uh, turn up for the other, thing, other things I'm going to say, which is fundamentally it's an indication that we think depression is not one disease. And what holds us back at the moment is our inability to define well-organized, clinically homogenous groups. Uh, we're still reliant on this um, uh, well-worked over but uh, poorly understood symptomatic uh, classification to make the diagnosis. I'll just go through two pieces of evidence will back up that point um, that depression is not one disease and one of these is based on the um, environmental causes. So most of us know that if a bad thing happens to us uh, there's a likelihood uh, that there will be an episode of depression. What you might not be so familiar with is that temporal relationship has been subject to considerable scrutiny and we're pretty certain now that when the relationship is causal then the episode of depression will have occurred within about three months. In other words, things that happen more than three months after a stressful life event are very unlikely to be causally related. This applies to single events, some bad thing particularly happening to you, but there's a separate type of, of environmental effects which have a very different temporal relationship. And that are things, those are things that happened in, in childhood, particularly uh, childhood sexual abuse, which we know is the single uh, largest uh, risk factor in terms of its odds ratio for developing depression. And I'm showing you this because the, the onset of uh, um, episodes of depression in relationship to that abuse is lifetime. So it breaks the rule of the first example I've given to you where there's a strict temporal relationship. There's a very different temporal relationship between that environmental cause. So that indicates that whatever is leading between the environment and the onset of depression has to follow some different pathway which we don't fully understand. The second piece of evidence to show you that this is not one disease comes from studies of the heritability of depression. I'm showing you here a summary from my colleague Ken Kendler of a large number of studies. Um, he's picked out what he thinks are the six best twin studies of depression and shows at the, the bottom of that uh, figure you can see uh, a heritability of um, 37 percent which has been backed up by subsequent larger scale studies so it's something of the order of 30 to 40 percent is the is the heritability but when you break it down by sex we make a a, a different observation so i'm showing you here two studies one in virginia uh, and one in sweden again both carried out by my colleague ken kendler and the vertical axis here gives the heritability for the uh, males and females shown in red and blue, um, which coincides with what you've seen in the previous slide, that the heritability is somewhere between 30 and 40%. There's a difference between men and women. That's a significant difference because the sample sizes here are large. It's a more heritable condition in women. But the real reason for showing you this is because of the green bar representing the genetic correlation, which you can see is far from unity. In other words, whatever genetic effects there are, are not completely shared between the sexes. So at that level, it's not one disease. So just to summarize, I've shown you that the clinical features that we use are sort of contradictory. You, you can have opposing uh, opposite features and yet still meet criteria. But the genetic effects differ by sex and then the environmental effects operate differently depending on the, the category of them. So it's perhaps not surprising that when we come to look at the genetic studies, there have been difficulties in identifying um, predisposing loci. So I'm showing you here a figure from, these are data from the UK Biobank, the standard genome-wide association uh, study plots where you can see uh, peaks indicating localization for genetic effects. And if we put onto this um, the uh, findings for major depressive disorder in the same cohort, it, it looks uh, pretty unimpressive. And our argument has been that the major reason for this difficulty is because we don't deal with a single disease and we're conflating many different conditions using the, the existing criteria. So how, how we 
how might we address it? Well, the, the, the approach that, that I took was uh, um, working with Ken. This is uh, my friend Ken. We're discussing these issues about how we might uh, improve the ability to, to identify genetic effects and overcome the heterogeneity problem. And we came up with a design where we would collect 6,000 cases and 6,000 controls. We'd only look at women for the reason I told you before, namely it's uh, more common, it's more heritable in women. We wanted to work with people who had recurrent depression because, again, there's evidence that uh, the genetic effects are different from those with single episode depression. And because of this problem about heterogeneity, we wanted to get as many of the risk factors as we could assessed. So personality, childhood sexual abuse, stressful life events, poor parenting, low social support, and also assess as much of the comorbidity as we could. Depression can occur in the context of drug abuse, in the context of alcohol uh, and um, smoking. All of these uh, are, have both a causal and uh, can cause uh, and, and can cause be, be caused by depression. So we needed to assess a large number of uh, comorbid diseases. And to do this, we decided in the end to work with colleagues in China because although it's a common disorder, by the time that we narrowed it down only to women, only to recurrent depression and various other exclusions, we were looking for a fairly specific group. So working with a large population helped us uh, to collect cases quickly. Um, and the way we set this up was that we would uh, travel to China, this is Ken at the podium, where he would be giving a, um, a week's training to our Chinese collaborators. We recruit hospitals into the study. We provide each of the interviewers with a laptop and they would use a computerized interview which would um, be monitored and recorded and we'd have a set of editors who would actually then listen in to make sure that the quality of the, of the, of the interview data um, was um, as, as, as expected. And of course, doing all of this with a Chinese group, when neither I nor Ken spoke any Chinese, was a bit of a challenge. But we set this up uh, and started in August 2008 with our colleagues in Shanghai and eventually recruited about 60 hospitals spread across China from the north to the south and collected, as we expected, about 12,000. All of these were sent down to collaborators in Shenzhen, where there is a sequencing institute, who used a rather unusual strategy. We used low-pass sequencing to generate our genotypes and then um, generated a, um, a genome-wide association plot, which looks like that, where we had a couple of loci which were exceeding genome-wide significance. And we were fortunate enough to find uh, a group who had a, a sample for us to carry out a replication. So this is just a, a, a summary of what we found, two loci on chromosome 10, giving you their p-values and their effect sizes. And our colleagues in, who had a smaller cohort in, in, uh, in Beijing were able to um, uh, give us the, the DNA for us to genotype and we were able to replicate both of those loci. So that brings us up to 2015 and you can see from that plot that uh, we're not really we're not doing as well as other diseases but we've made some impact on the condition and the question then was how could we push this further and uh, initially at least we wanted to detect more loci but we also had this underlying issue of the heterogeneity of the condition we'd looked at recurrent major depression in women only how could we how could we expand our search to look for for other other features and that's really why I, I ended up coming to work in UCLA, because UCLA had um, begun to consider taking on what they called grand challenges and had asked the community of scientists here to come up with ideas of major projects that, that could be tackled. And uh, this is uh, Dan Geshwin, for those of you who know him, about to introduce me giving <coughs> yet another talk about major depression. This is six years ago as part of a series of consultations around what um, problems UCLA could, could tackle. And the aim was to do this on a campus-wide scale and deal with a, a, a problem of um, a major health uh, issue. And that's exactly uh, what major depression is and um, why it was eventually taken on as one of the uh, grand challenges. So UCLA established this Depression Grand Challenge 
and we wanted to treat depression now. Treatments aren't that great, but we can do something. Uh, we wanted to find the causes of depression and then develop new treatments. And because this is California and people think in these sorts of scale of things, we wanted to uh, cure it, get rid of it. But we choose time so far in advance that I'll be well retired, so I can't be held responsible when we don't quite meet them. But um, maybe you'll be joining us and uh, with your help, uh, we'll, we'll be able to tackle it. So how was this, um, this designed? Let me now just tell you briefly how we thought about setting up this study and um, the progress we've made. So there are four components. At the centre of the, of the um, Depression Grand Challenge is a, is a large study of the genetics of depression, which we call 100K. 100K just is a big number, not because we necessarily will recruit 100,000 patients, but um, we, it's clear we're going to need a large sample. Uh, and Going back to what I told you before about this being a heterogeneous condition, I think you should think of this as more as a series of focused studies answering specific questions. It's similar to what we've already done in, in China where we've gone for recurrent depression in women, we would need to ask questions about, say, single episode depression, about depression occurring in the context of comorbid disorders. Um, but however we do this, we're going to need a large sample. In order to interpret the results of that, that study, we collaborate with um, the neuroscientists, there's a huge and very um, good neuroscience community at UCLA and we have a, a number of investigators who are interested in this work and are prepared to collaborate with us. At the bottom there is the, uh, a circle representing the innovative treatment network and this has two aims, one of which is to provide treatment now as much as we can to wh whoever we can and then secondly, to take the discovery neuroscience, all of the insights we have into the mechanism of depression to develop new treatments. And then the fourth component, awareness and hope, is dealing with the difficulty people have in talking about depression, about the stigma of depression. And here we've begun to work with people in the north of campus, people who work in arts and drama, people who can help others get across this message and to tell their story, both about what it's like to suffer from depression and also to talk to those uh, who have the condition. I'm going to focus a little bit now on the centrepiece, the, this 100K study. Um, and as I said, we want to look at about 100,000 uh, people, uh, but it uh, uh, will be broken down. And we identify these people from the UC health system. And notice I've written there characterized depression trajectories. So we, we don't just need to understand what causes depression, we also want to know why it happens again and again. So we have to do this as a longitudinal study. And in that large sample, we want to collect a lot of information, genetic, environmental, social causes of depression. The things I've already told you that we collected in China, but it, in spades, even more so. And then we'd hope to, during the study, identify biomarkers uh, for both course and treatment response. Setting up a study like this, however, and this is true for all studies of depression, we, we, we meet three specific challenges. And the first is that there is no objective measure of depression. We're just reliant upon the, the, uh, um, the symptoms that I've shown you, which are, can be assessed by doctors with an interview based, or as I've shown you here, with questionnaires. So this is technology that hasn't changed really from about um, 100 years and it's, it, it's um, uh, subjective, it's biased, time intensive and it only gives you a single episode, it's static. The second problem that we meet is it's not possible to monitor mood in real time. So if you come and see me and I assess your mood in my clinic then I might get a picture that looks like this where um, uh, I, I've seen you on the third visit and you seem a little better than you were maybe on the first visit and I have no way of predicting that the following week you're going to have a severe uh, episode of depression. And the expectation is if we could measure be mood between uh, those visits using uh, a much more um, fine-grained analysis, we might uh, pick up a picture that looks like this. And we have some idea of what information we'd need. I've marked down here changes of sleep, social withdrawal, uh, 
physical activity. All of these we strongly suspect, but yet can't prove, though I'll show you some data about this later, we strongly suspect that this would be information that would allow us to make the diagnosis and to predict what's going to happen to you. The third challenge that we face is that when subjects are recruited to a study, we know that about half of those meeting criteria will not be in, in treatment. So this means that if we launch a large study of depression, let's say we go for 100,000 people, uh, about half of those, that's 50,000 people maybe, are going to be needing treatment, which is not something I can go down to the local clinic and ask for help. Maybe if it's my brother or sister who's depressed, but if I come in saying, here's 50,000 people we want treated, they're not going to be too pleased. So when we design the study, we have to have in place ways of, of treating people before we can actually recruit. So I'll now tell you about how we've gone about addressing these problems. And the first is to deal with this question about how we can measure depression at scale and collect information about mood. The first thing we use is an online screening tool. This is something that Robert Gibbons in Chicago has developed. It's um, a uh, quick four to five minute screening item. It has a, a couple of um, advantages. Um, the way it works is it has a bank of a few thousand questions whose correlational structure has already been known. So basically, uh, Robert has carried out um, an assessment of the item response so that if he picks at random one question, depending on your reply, he'll know what are the most informative subsequent items to pick so that he can quickly arrive at the, diagnos at the diagnosis. So it's fast and most usefully it can be repeated. Unlike a questionnaire, which is always asking you the same five or six questions, uh, this will, will be asking about mood in different ways and therefore is less prone to response fatigue. So we, we've, we've been using this. Uh, the second thing that we've been using is a behavioural health tracking app. So this is a way of getting at your mood in down to the millisecond almost and that we are putting an app on people's phones so we can continuously collect data on behavior so it's an objective measure of behavior using things like the GPS activity levels um, can we take information about the quality of your voice can we take information about um, your uh, social contacts phone calls can we take that information and turn it um, into a prediction of your your mental state. We have made some progress with this and I'll show you some results uh, in a moment but before I discuss that I, I need to deal with the this critical issue about how we actually deliver treatment because we can make diagnoses based on the online uh, assessments and maybe from the behaviour but then I face the problem of how do I treat you. Not surprisingly we use uh, your phone to treat you we work with a group in um, Australia who have developed uh, a um, internet-based cognitive behavioural therapy method called This Way Up. And we can del deliver that directly to your phone. Because UCLA has a large and effective student counselling programme, we're also able to draw upon what are called resilience peer network. We train uh, students to provide support to those people who, uh, who, who we think will need it. So in brief, the way this works is that we will provide online screening and classify people into those who have no evidence of depression, but we will continue to monitor them. It doesn't mean that because they don't uh, have it now, they won't develop it later. And those who have evidence of depression. And if there is evidence of depression, then we have a triaging system. We put them into tiers one, two and three. The tier ones and two, we provide online therapy plus or minus support from psychologists and the resilience peers. Tier three, these are people who, for example, we have evidence that they might uh, be thinking of harming themselves. They will need uh, psychiatrists uh, to see them. We will call them into the clinic. We will visit them if necessary and um, provide standard uh, psychiatric care. The ICBT, Internet Cognitive Behavioral Therapy Model, is called This Way Up. It's, um, uh, Gavin Andrews has developed this in, in Australia. Uh, it's um, 
relatively easy to use, as you can imagine, and we found that um, the students, and I'll tell you about this in a moment, who've been using it, have, have found this um, particularly helpful because it's something they can do whenever they want, wherever. You don't need to be seeing a doctor. You, you can do the therapy at 3 o'clock in the morning if, if you want. So overall, we have this integrated model where we are screening, regularly screening, sometimes even on a weekly basis, uh, analysing and then making decisions as to whether we should treat and tracking the behavioural profiles using the app on the phone. And the last part of my talk, I want briefly just to tell you a little bit about the data that we've collected and, and how we analyse it. So one thing we found surprisingly useful is just where people are, just taking activity measures based on the, um, the GPS uh, coordinates from the, from the phone. So here's an example where so, uh, one of the students that we've enrolled into this study um, has been allowing us to track uh, the time they spend in different parts of the, of the campus. And we can then convert that into a, a, a picture of what their activities would be. So we can say whether they're socialising, going to class, uh, sleeping, weekend off campus and exercising and relate that then um, to, the, to the moods that we get from the online assessments. I, like others, have been a little surprised at uh, how useful that rather limited bit of information is in predicting mood. And just to give you one example, this is uh, just some data points from one of the um, one of the subjects, you can see that the depression severity score tracks very nicely, surprisingly so, with the, the percent of time that, that that person is spending at home. However, there's one of the issues we faced with this is that what tracks with, with mood with one person is not always going to be the same as what tracks with somebody else. So we've had to think of ways of personalizing the interpretation of this information. And given that we're collecting this uh, over now over six months, a year in some cases, we, we have a lot, of, a lot of data to play with so that we can make this as personalised as, as necessary. And it's not just activity that's proving to be useful. We have also been using phone on and off time just as a, a, a surrogate for um, sleep. And what you're seeing here is um, our S best estimates of uh, the time that person has spent asleep. So last thing they do at night is turn off the phone and first thing they do in the morning is pick up the phone. Uh, and you can see on the right hand side there that there's um, a set of dots in the, uh, in the lower section which indicates that that person is waking up much more early than they were for the rest of the, sign, rest of the time. And that, that turns out to be um, uh, a time which uh, they're, they're depressed. And early morning wakening is a very classic sign of depression. So that simple on-off measure is, is already making uh, us a, a, a useful measure of, of mood. So how do we take this information and turn it into a, 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 a measure? Here's data from a, a single subject. Um, this is from a, a few months when they're giving us their um, mood severity scores. So the CAT stands for Computerized Adaptive Test. This is Robert Gibbons's measure. So what we then do is we take um, the activity measures. We've got some data also from an, the accelerometer about this. We can combine that plus the, the sleep time. That's just the on and off measure from the, um, from the phone. And we can ask, well, how does that then predict the, the, um, the mood measures? We interpolate from those individual black dots what the overall mood should be in a more continuous way, and then we relate that to what we, what we think it might be based on the behavioural measures. And this is one example, in fact, from that same, that same person. And you can see that there is, a, 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 well, what to our eyes was a remarkable degree of, um, an agree, of agreement. Furthermore, we found that it is predictive up to about two weeks, with about a, at the moment about 60 to 70 percent accuracy. So if we have measures now from people's phones, we should be able to say within, as I said, with an accuracy of about 60 to 70 percent, what their mood measure at, based on the CAT is going to be. And of course, that puts us in a very strong position to begin to intervene earlier uh, before a, a severe episode uh, happens. Um, we have now rolled this out uh, to the student body here. It's about 18 months ago. 
Uh, all undergraduates were offered this. We've screened about four and a half students so far. And uh, of those 740 signed up for the internet-based uh, treatment, we had 163 suicide risk alerts and 187 severe depression alerts. And so far we've had expected, um, not total uh, um, response, but certainly exactly what we would have expected given the evidence in terms of the ability of the CBT to, uh, to treat people. And the students themselves have given us a, a huge support over this. We've had uh, many people write to us saying how transformative this has been for them uh, during their, their time at university. Uh, so if you want to come and join in this project, please let me know. We are expanding out. There have been other universities that have already contacted us about sending this program to their own groups. I've been working with colleagues in, in other countries. We've uh, started to try this in, in other campuses and I hope that um, it would at least um, within the time frame that we've allowed ourselves mean that we can at least deliver effective treatment to all of those people who need it wherever they are. Thank you very much.